Rebecca Stevenson, business commentator. Kia ora. Welcome, Rebecca. Morena, Catherine. How are you? I'm very good. I hope you are doing okay. Um, We're grinding through it. <laughs> I've got to tell you a funny joke. My <laughs> dear colleague in Auckland, one of two dear colleagues in Auckland, just sent us a bunch of picnic bars in <laughs> the post to Wellington. <laughs> And I thought, oh, well, that's nice. We should really be sending you the nice stuff. But we've just clicked. It's a celebration of the fact you can have picnics in Auckland now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And even one um, <laughs> entrepreneur up here has tried to turn his uh, restaurant into a picnic spot. And he's charging $100 um, to Aucklanders to let them come and picnic at his restaurant in an attempt to get some money going. So, yes, we're very well, aware that we're allowed to picnic now. We're getting marketed to as well. Actually, I was reading an interesting article, it might be something to follow up on, that a lot of outdoor dining, what do we call it? In, uh, what do we call it? El fresco dining may well be the secret to businesses uh, being able to build up over summer mm. months because, of course, there's now regarded to be a lower risk of spread outdoors. So it may well become yeah. very much the thing this summer uh, in parts yeah, of the country. So. But Glenda's um, sense of humour, uh, how can we describe it, team? <laughs> The picnic bar about <laughs> sums it up. And it seriously took someone else to point out the significance. Thank you. I've already yeah. had a go at it, Glenda. Now, let's begin with the rise of the anti-work movement. Uh, yeah, that's right. So this is a really fascinating one. And I guess it's, you know, not actually um, unsurprising, but one of my favourite places to browse on the internet is a Reddit called Anti-Work. And even um, the Reddit itself has become increasingly popular. There's more than 500,000 members on this um, subreddit at any one time talking about, you know, this gross sort of glorification of working to live culture, the hustle culture and work all hours of the day culture. And they're really heavily promoting that, you know, there is another option for our lives where we don't revolve most of our days around laboring for someone else's financial benefit. But, you know, once you start sort of poking underneath the surface of this kind of exhaustion, um, there is some interesting research that's been done around it. You know, I found an essay that was written a couple of years ago, which argued that anti-work is the moral alternative to our jobs obsession and that this has plagued our society for too long. Um, talking about anti-work being an antidote to this pernicious culture of hard work that has taken over not only our minds, but also our precious time. Um, and one of the things that you see a lot of the time underpinning this sort of backlash against hustle culture and work all hours culture is the fact that the gap between the most wealthy in society and the less wealthy is getting bigger and bigger. And I guess there's a sense of sort of frustration and um, almost desperation, you know, particularly in the US where you see sometimes really low wages, really long hours, and then the elite is just getting wealthier and wealthier. Um, I think the pandemic is definitely playing into this. You know, we are all thinking, I think, more about our lives and what we want to be doing. Um, there's seen some surveys where work-life balance has now overtaken salary, which has been number one for the past decade for workers as the most important attraction for job seekers in New Zealand. And we're seeing these themes and trends across many countries, you know, surveys out of the Middle East, the US and Europe are also showing that for those who are not rejecting work altogether, work-life balance is now an absolute imperative and not just a nice to have. One of the really interesting things that we're seeing lately is even in Asia, you know, which is really, I guess, almost typifies this sort of work to exhaustion um, ideal that's become so popularized. Um, so there tr there's this sort of 996 idea where you're expected to work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. for six days a week that the Alibaba founder, Jack Ma, was a big proponent of. Um, but post-pandemic, more Chinese young people are rejecting 996 in favor of Taiping or what's called lying flat culture. And so the lying flat movement rejects the rat race um, with many people saying, look, they don't want to work at all. Um, whereas for other people, they're saying lying flat is just about balance, 
work hard when you must, but build in time to lie flat and relax. Um, so it's really fascinating. And I guess I do understand it, you know. Um, we're working at home more now. The way we're working is changing. And people are realizing perhaps that, you know, giving your everything to the grind culture is not necessarily how they want to live anymore. But you just touched on something really significant, which is the consequences of our economic uh, underpinnings of the last sort of three or four decades, which is that, yes, uh, societies overall can become more wealthy but the wealth divide also happens mm. at the same time under these kinds of policies. And so you used to work hard, right, to get ahead. Mm. You put your head down, you worked hard because that was how you saved your mortgage or how you got your business off the ground or how you got your career advanced. What we're mm. increasingly seeing happening is that working hard for too many people can't even pay the rent. And the point you make is often those not doing a lot but with assets are the ones getting ahead. So that connection between hard work, mm. at least for a time of life, and results and benefits is being severed. So no wonder people are saying, why am I doing it? Exactly. You know, and that is one of the most popular memes that you see popping up. And it's, um, you can see a breakdown of, you know, people's salary and their earnings from even, you know, sort of the 80s, you know, the cost of a house, your salary, um, how much you would be paying for general daily items. And then it's compared to the salary inflation of today. And it's just not bridging that gap. You know, people can work, like you say, as hard as they want. But with the cost of everything has gone up, salaries haven't kept pace. They cannot afford the same lifestyle that they saw, for example, their parents being able to attain um, just through working for a salary. So I think that is really pushing a lot of the sense of desperation. You know, um, what is the point if I can't ever actually earn enough to live a really a nice life where I can enjoy myself? Which is you a know, there's, potential, there's a lot of desperation in it. It's a potential crisis for the economic system that we've had all these years because they do depend still very much on workers and on uh, productivity that has been earned too much at the cost of cutting wages and lifting hours. This is, there are many factors, as you know, into a productivity mm. gain. One of the largest and most impactful is technology and the second one that sits very high is education and skills improvement. But for so yeah. often... Economies like ours went to cut costs, cut costs, make people work longer, make people work, work harder. And the problem with that is if people then start actually bowing out right at the time when we're heading into a retirement boom across many of our societies and we're going to have fewer and fewer taxpayers funding that anyway, we really are heading for a fundamental crash. You can, balance, you can flip that and say, hey, aren't the machines going to save us? Aren't they going to take all the jobs anyway? But we're not there yet. And mm -hmm. um, the other thing that might be a big risk to the economies that we've had right now is if people do say I'm not going to work as long and as hard, guess what else they're going to do? They're going to pull in their consumption and particularly their discretionary spending. So there are lots of reasons to be thinking about this right now and whether we ought yeah. to be doing things quite differently. Yeah, it is really fascinating. You know, you see it a lot where people are just talking about, um, you know, in the US, I think it, it seems to be at the forefront of this where, you know, retail outlets are shutting down because workers don't want to work for wages that they can't live on. And there's sort of a dawning realization, I think, happening that, hey, hang on, actually, us little people, workers, and also our consumers, we are a huge element here in the economy and economic success. And there's a, I think, yeah, realization that workers and consumers pay, play a huge role in that and that pulling back from consumption could actually be very damaging for a lot of businesses. It but, might you know, not be though. People have to think it through. For those workers and it might not be either for the environment either and it might be a lovely little reset if we think optimistically and positively. Uh, a lovely little reset from the sort of obsessive consumption that's been pushed at us and that we've been part of pushing. Um, who's that? <laughs> Sorry about that. That's Freddie. <laughs> Freddie, hi Freddie. Hilariously, last time a dog barked during an interview, someone said my my um, Doberman is now barking at the radio. So anyway, that'll be happening around the place. Apologies, we, everybody. No, no, not at all. Not at all. It's delightful. It's um, it's you know we're facing this kind of massive transition anyway. We've got energy transitions coming. Um, we know we desperately have to um, reduce emissions very, very quickly in order to avert the worst of a climate crisis. And now you've got the workers saying, why am I working insanely like this? And the next step will be the consumers saying, why am I buying this many clothes 
when much of it is completely unnecessary and I'm only buying it because it's so damn cheap or perhaps because the last one I made um, didn't last as long as it should. It could be a happy coming together and a sort of a critical moment in many of our economies for rethinking the way the whole damn thing works. I think you're bang on and, you know, you've really hit a lot of key points that you see people talking about, you know, when they are discussing the anti-work movement. It is partially realising that, you know, you can just work to buy and what is the point of that? You know, it is very short term and you're getting the sort of adrenaline rush in your life by buying things and acquiring items that really you don't necessarily need or you could live without. And so I think on the other side of it is also the sort of the off-grid movement. Um, and there's a lot of other movements around, yeah, divorcing yourself con- from consumerism and just thinking more consciously about the kind of life you want to live, the kind of work you want to do, and how much you want to be sort of a consumer as opposed to um, giving something back or doing something Rebecca, more. it's also about how success is measured. And I don't understand why success should be measured by working 996. Um, I understand why you might do that for time. Again, because you're working or you're studying and you're or you're setting up a business. There's a, there's a season for these things. But when it's just you know, your average payday job and you're not getting ahead anyway, that's not success. That's a grind. And Mm. success being a healthy balance in life, you know, success being happy with what you've got. (laughs) Mm. Old-fashioned notion that it is, maybe this whole generation is going to say, that's the success I'm looking for, not Gordon Gecko on Wall Street or Elon Musk for that matter. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I had someone, you know, give me a good example of this recently where um, they were working at a job and they had been offered a promotion and they turned down this promotion and more responsibility and bigger salary because they simply didn't want to actually do what was required for that job and salary because they wanted to just have a more of a relaxed lifestyle. And the person that I was talking was saying, you know, I really actually respect and admire that because... Life, your life is for living the way you want to live it. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how employers, you know, respond to this kind of um, change that's happening. And in particular, you know, it's going to be um, interesting with millennial workers and younger workers coming through who are going to demand different things from their employers and from their workplaces. Some are being and proactive it's going to be really and trialling the work with a four-day week. I'm always a little suspicious of the four-day week if you cram you know, as much work into the four days, you're not really getting ahead. But the argument Mm. is that by cutting out a lot of time-wasting kind of Mm. unnecessary meetings and, and, you know, just freeing people up for a little bit of autonomy about how they get about their work, we can can get things done in four days. There's there's lots of sort of ideas about, but when you get a groundswell on the scale that you're talking about, that's when the change gets forced. So is this all part of the great resignation I've been hearing about as well? People just literally, I'm out of here. Yeah, that's right. That definitely ties into it. And you're consistently seeing stories of people posting on social media saying, hey, I joined the great resignation today. And a lot of the things that we've been talking about are being pushed, people be feeling pushed into resigning because it just feels like there's never enough. They can never work long enough hours. And that just the demands from employers on their employees just aren't worth it. And it's just not worth the sacrifice um, that they're taking. So you see, I think in, te- in the tech industry in particular, you're seeing a lot of people um, have been resigning and there's been loads of statistics out of um, Australia and all around the world about people, sa- thousands and thousands of people saying that they're thinking about quitting. There was a Microsoft survey um, of 30,000 workers, which showed 41% were thinking about quitting or changing their professions this year. And in the US, more than 4 million people quit their jobs in April, which was the biggest spike on record. Um, So, I mean, I guess the pandemic has done a lot for people in terms of really focusing their minds on what they want to be spending their time doing. Excellent stuff. Uh, And are we seeing signs in the New Zealand um, workforce to such the same extent and also among New Zealand employers? I mentioned a couple of that we know are trialling the four-day week. But are Mm. we seeing people picking up or beginning to pick up and talk about the movement here or or what this global movement might be signalling for the future here? 
Yeah, there was a really fascinating example I actually came across on LinkedIn um, of a young Auckland entrepreneur called Matt Billington. And he'd actually come across my radar um, when he was a teenager because he had won um, some awards through the Lion Foundation Young Enterprise Scheme with his company of the year, which was a almond milk business called Olele, which they managed to actually get into supermarkets and turn into quite a successful little business. Um, And after he founded that business, he was working over 80 hours a week at an online education startup. And then he started running his own digital operations company. Um, But he's really stepped back from it all. He said he enjoyed building his business. And um, but after nine months of being burnt out and having no free time to spend with friends, his thinking began to shift. And he said he started to yearn not just for work, but for work with purpose, um, which he defined as something larger than me. So what he's done is he's actually handed his company over to the co-founder and stepped back and is just taking some time off to think about his next step. And he said, I want to be able to choose what to do with my day when I wake up and I want to live first and work second. And I think that really does sum it up for a lot of people. Rebecca, thank you so much. Rebecca Stevenson is the head of news at Business Desk and our business commentator today.